much for coming to attend the SILIPS uh, AGM this morning. Uh, so I'd like to declare the AGM open. Um, I'm Heather Marshall, a Senior Librarian from Glasgow Caledonian and I'm Chair of the SILIPS Trustee Board. To my right we have well, you can just just say you can introduce us out. I'm Fran Bavey, I'm Deputy of of Historic Environment Scotland, and I am the Treasurer, so we can going to report today. Uh, and I'm Sean McNamara, Chief Executive of the South Scotland Chapter. Do we have any apologies for absence, Sean? We do not. Um, I'm assuming you've all read last year's minutes. <laughs> yeah. Could we have... Um, so they were circulated. Um, could we have an approver, Tony? Thank you. And a seconder, Kevin. Thank you. So we'd like to move on uh, to receive the trustees' annual report and accounts for the year that ended 31st of December, 2022. Um, I won't talk through the whole of the annual report, I will just highlight some key points from 2022. Um, so the SILIPS president was Amina Shah. SILIPS operations were led by Kirsten Macquarie and Sean McNamara. <coughs> and at the end of 2022, it was agreed to begin recruitment for a graduate trainee who is now in place. And SILIPS welcomed Leah Higgins, a great addition to the team. SILIPS delivered an advocacy programme in advance of the local government elections called Libraries Are Essential and responded to consultations affecting public and school libraries throughout the year. SILIPS awarded the first £10,000 of funding as part of the research fund. A career mentorship programme was delivered and will again be delivered this year. SILIPS staff attended meetings of the Implementation Group for the National Strategy of School Libraries and the Advisory Group for the New Strategy for Public Libraries in Scotland. SILIPS also continued to work in close partnership with organisations such as SLIC, the Scottish Library and Information Council and Literature Alliance Scotland. <clears throat> they advocate for librarians and library services including the launch of PLANS, a new advocacy network for public libraries in Scotland. During Libraries Week, SILIPS ran a range of activities and events including hashtag Library5 on Twitter as well as social media takeovers and events. The Winspiration programme has continued with a series of events and online content supporting women in leadership and librarianship. SILIPS presented the Scotland Library and Information Professional of the Year to Sarah Louise MacDonald of the University of Edinburgh. SILIP in Scotland delivered a programme of events and training aimed at supporting the continued professional development needs of library and information professionals with a mostly online programme supplementing the in-person conference including various mini-conferences and one-hour webinars. SILIPS also sponsored and sat on the advisory group of the iWrite Festival in Glasgow, including a sponsored session. So I think we can tell from the highlights of that annual report just how much work Sean, Kirsten and Leah um, have got done in that, in that year. And I'd just like to take a moment to thank them for their very hard work. I'd also like to take a moment to congratulate Kirsten on her chartership that she successfully <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to move over to Fran to provide the Treasurer's report. Thank you. So, um, obviously the accounts are in that annual report um, that I'm sure everyone has looked through in great detail. Um, so, SILIPS funded the office accommodation for two SILIPS staff located in Glasgow with um, costs for resources such as equipment um, shared between SILIP and SILIP in Scotland. 
Silip UK funded the staff salaries, um, so they appear in their accounts, not ours, so you won't see them there. Uh, Silip contributed a grant of £22,000 to um, Silips, it's about Silip and Silips. Silips to cover the costs of Silips delivering Silip activity in <laughs> <laughs> um, um, The board did approve a um, small reduction in reserves um, last year to absorb the additional costs from a return to an in-person conference and also for the £10,000 um, research fund, which is why the overall profit and loss is in um, a deficit. Um, if any of you were at the session yesterday on the reveal project, you can see what some of the you will have seen what some of the research fund is going towards. However, despite that, we still hold the required level of reserves to ensure we're protected against uncertainty in the sector. Um, and also, most of our online events were um, were maintained as free of charge for Silips members. So I'm going to hand over to um, hand over to Heather for the. Approving and seconding. Thank you. Can we have an approver for the account, please? Thanks. Can we have a seconder? Oh, I need <laughs> Thank you. So, moving on to the honorary awards. So, each year, the Silips uh, Skill, which is the Scottish Chartered Institute, Charitable Institute organisation, invites nominations for honorary awards. We received the nominations for approval as follows. Shauna Donaldson for her work supporting Silips and their networks while working with Dundee Libraries. Cathy Penfold for her work supporting the Silips Council and the Cataloging and Indexing Group, now known as the Metadata and Discovery Group. Annette Thane for supporting our work via a strong partnership with NHS Education for Scotland. And finally, for Kerry Hudson and Damien Barr for both being tireless advocates for libraries. So if you are happy, please could you, um, somebody approve those honorary uh, fellowships, please? Amina. <coughs> and a seconder? Tony, thank you. <coughs> Would anyone like to put any other business into the record? <coughs> That's the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> so there's been no other notified business. Um, so thank you all for attending. Um, welcome everybody. Um, it's my great pleasure to formally open the second day of conference. Uh, welcome back to everyone who attended yesterday and a very warm welcome to everyone who's travelled up to attend today. Um, as Sean said, I'm Richard Ed, I'm Director of Service Delivery and Change at the University of Stirling um, and genuinely honoured to be Celebs President for 2023. Um, for those of you that did miss yesterday, we had a, a, a properly amazing day. I think it was um, some of the feedback we got from people was just incredible. Um, in particular, some of the keynotes were really, really impactful and emotional. Um, and I think a lot of people were quite taken aback at just how, how, how moved we all felt by some of the stories that we heard. It really was something else. Um, I think we've got a brilliant programme lined up for today and I'm confident that it'll be just as good today. Um, at conference dinner last night, we presented the award of Scotland's Library and Information Professional of the Year to the truly inspirational Jenny Findlay, um, celebrating her work at the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. And I'd just like to say another public well done to Jenny, so please could you join me in congratulating her once again. So on to today, um, the conference theme, as you know, is looking to the future. Um, I'm delighted to welcome members, colleagues and exhibitors to the conference. It's uh, the biggest annual gathering of library and information professionals in Scotland. We have around 160 delegates each day, um, and we're here to hear keynote presentations, attend workshops, breakout sessions, um, and this year's conference sold out faster than any conference previously. Um, once again, I'd like to repeat something I said yesterday and thank all of the exhibitors who make the conference possible genuinely without the support it wouldn't be possible in this shape and form. Um, the exhibition with the exhibitors is open all day today and it's well worth a visit, not just for the uh, Samsung tablet. Um, thanks too to our platinum sponsors, Belinda, Di uh, Belinda Digital and Bibliotheca because they've sponsored all of our keynotes um, and the conference dinner yesterday evening. So next on the agenda is our Student Awards, which I've got the great pleasure of presenting. Um, the Student Awards are an annual celebration of achievement for library and information students who have excelled on SILIP accredited university programmes. And the students are nominated by their academic staff. 
I'm pleased to announce that this year's recipients are Nicholas Herbert from Robert Gordon University. Just a round of applause for Nicholas. <laughs> we have David Inglis from University of Strathclyde. And finally, we have Dara Maguire from University of Glasgow. Um, so, on to our first keynote, um, I'm delighted to welcome Josh Sendal, De Deputy University Librarian at University of Leeds. Um, Josh promotes open knowledge, freely accessible libraries, and the role of equity, diversity, and inclusion as essential elements of healthy and resilient cultures and communities. Um, for anyone that's been watching the work that uh, Josh and Masood and the team at Leeds have been doing. Um, they know that they're really shaking things up through strategy with vision and ambition. And uh, I'm fanboying here, so I'm super excited to <laughs> hear from Josh. So please give a warm silks welcome to, to Josh. Well, good morning and many thanks for that kind introduction. It's very much appreciated. So this morning, I guess I'm inviting you to join me on a journey through the wonderful world of libraries that we all know and love through their transformative power that they hold within the space between and along the way i'll also share just a little bit of my own poetry i hope you enjoy it in the space between knowledge resides where ideas converge and dreams collide there lies a fertile ground deep and wide, where hearts and minds meet side by side. And when I speak of the, the space between, I'm referring to the rich and fertile ground that we all know and love, where those ideas converge, where those minds meet, where innovation flourishes. Now I believe that libraries are uniquely positioned to occupy this space, acting as bridges that connect individuals from diverse backgrounds that serve as inclusive and democratic spaces where we can welcome people from all walks of life irrespective of their backgrounds their socio-economic status or indeed their educational level because it's within the walls of libraries that individuals who may be divided along those lines can come together and to share in the vast tapestry of human knowledge. I didn't have a garden, so I'd head to the park. With its carpets of green, life didn't feel so dark. Branches, stems and leaves diffused radiant light, recharging my soul to see me through the night. Moments of calm, away from the pace of the city. Flowers in bloom, even weeds that looked pretty. Boards naming trees I'd only ever known by sight. Beach sounded strange, but Scott's Pine sounded right. That special place where I wandered and found such wonderful sights and soothing soft sounds. A gentle spring breeze rustling the elder's eaves as I perched on a bench counting clover leaves. The space to relax, to reflect and recover, worlds to embrace, enjoy and discover. At the core of our libraries, lies the promise of discovery the seemingly simple idea that anyone can enter and embark, embark on a voyage of discovery whoever they are wherever they come from to me our libraries are parks for the mind and soul the libraries are also treasure troves filled with books, documents, multimedia resources and digital collections that provide a wealth of information waiting to be unearthed. They, they foster that, that spirit of intellectual curiosity which encourages individuals to delve into the unknown, to question the established, to expand their horizons. Libraries empower us to explore new realms of thought, 
to embrace those different perspectives and to engage in lifelong learning. They are havens of discovery that nurture our innate human thirst for knowledge. The libraries are not merely repositories of information. They are living, breathing ecosystems that adapt and evolve to meet the needs of their communities. And so in today's rapidly changing world, libraries have become more than about just books, although books will always be at our core, because they are spaces that foster exploration and experimentation. Libraries house maker spaces, digital media labs and cutting edge technologies that encourage hands-on learning, creativity and innovation. They provide access to tools, technologies and the skills and resources that enable individuals to turn their ideas into reality from 3D printers to coding workshops. Libraries empower us to explore the boundaries of our imagination and to embrace the joy of creation. Now, while libraries can be sanctuaries of peace, they're not isolated islands. They're interconnected networks that facilitate connection. And so please know, delegates, friends in the audience today, that the work you do to enable those moments of connection is vital and it can make a difference. It can make a difference in our universities. In the 2022 Student Academic Experience Survey, co-published by Advance HE and the Higher Education Policy Institute, a new question on loneliness indicated that higher education can be a lonely place with nearly one in four students feeling lonely all or most of the time. Creating those opportunities for connection is likewise important in wider society. Again, in 2022, looking at public opinions and social trends, the Office for National Statistics found that around one in five or 22% of adults reported feeling lonely always, often, or some of the time. And so in this evolving digital age, where technology could serve to isolate us, libraries stand as beacons for human connection and community engagement. They provide spaces for people to come together, to engage in meaningful conversations and to build vital social capital. Like Aberdeen City Library's Memories Scotland event, open to older people and those of all ages affected by dementia, loneliness, social isolation and other mental health conditions. Like West Dunbartonshire's Quest Computer Course, like Dundee's range of reading groups, like Perth and Kim Ross, who take mobile libraries to the people to bridge gaps created by geography like Glasgow City Libraries who enable Lego fun across a range of different sites. In sharing these examples, I offer just a glimpse of what's on offer. And I share those because I know that those book clubs, author talks, workshops and community events are genuine lifelines for many. For some, they may be the only time for days or weeks where they can share a word, a laugh, a smile, or even a tear with another human being. Moments which foster empathy and moments which foster understanding, which I think we desperately need. Now, I'm going to jump back in time to a morning in early November in 2016. I sat waiting for my name to be called in the GP surgery, anticipating that I could be waiting for some time. And I had time to think. It was a morning on which I'd woken up shell-shocked. A certain Donald Trump had been elected President of the United States of America. Now, during his election campaign, the media had shared examples of times 
throughout his life where he publicly made sexist, misogynistic, racist remarks, seemingly without remorse or regret. This was a man who had been elected to the highest office of an institution which many regarded as being at the helm of the free world. And I couldn't quite believe it. It was, however, the second time that year that I'd found myself in such a state of disbelief. The first was following the EU referendum results where the UK voted to leave the European Union. On the campaign road towards that result, I'd watched in disbelief, sometimes abject horror, as politicians appeared to hallucinate outlandish and divisive claims. It seemed to me that the victors of the US presidential election in 2016 and indeed the EU referendum uh, result had led, at least in part, with a narrative that it was only through their victory that normal people could hope to take back control of the borders and stem the flow of immigration. Now, I was shocked, but as an ethnic minority member of UK society, I was also scared. I was scared because those campaign results and those campaigns had stoked the flames of prejudice. And in the months that followed, UK Home Office data demonstrated a steep rise in reported hate crimes in England and Wales. So I sat there on that morning, wondering how had we got here? Or at least from my world view, how had we got it so wrong? And then it hit me like a ton of bricks during those campaigns, I'd sought out, and indeed the algorithms had served up, social media, platforms, news stories, perspectives, and people whose opinions aligned with my own worldview. I've been living in an echo chamber. And since then, I've been on my own journey of discovery and exploration. And through our libraries, I've encountered models, theories, and thinkers, which I found helpful. The most recent of those, a book by Tim Urban, uh, which is called What's Our Problem? It does a wonderful job of working through psychology, political theory, neuroscience, and modern day political movements. And it injects a fairly healthy dose of illustrative analogies and humor along the way. But it provides a perspective on how we arrived where we are today, and where I was in 2016. Urban invites us to reflect on whether we've ever seen a moth flying mindlessly into a light bulb. Ah, silly moth. The moth is doing that because it's driven by its primitive instincts, by an urge to fly toward the light of the moon. And to be fair, that's a technique which it has effectively used for eons for nocturnal navigation. But unfortunately, the moth's instincts haven't quite caught up with changes in the world, namely the advances in technology and the proliferation of all those non-moon lights. And so we may poke fun at the poor moth, but we all have primitive urges, for example, to eat and survive. And I suppose in fairness, our primitive mind has done a pretty good job of keeping us alive. And yet, you could say that human progress has created a world where the primitive mind isn't too well equipped. This is where our, our higher mind enters the story. This is what gives us the ability to think outside of ourselves, to self-reflect, to get wiser with experience, to analyze things, and to engage in long-term planning. A higher mind would rather like for us to behave like the sophisticated, civilized society folk in the debonair world we exist today. 
Now, the high mind and the primitive mind, they're a funny duo. When things are going well, they look kind of like this. Here, our higher mind is in charge, while our little primitive pal chases around his next dopamine hit. Our primitive pal is a simple guy. He's interested in things like reproducing and helping his offspring to survive. Now, this is all stuff that the higher mind is on board with when it makes sense. Suffice to say that these two characters are in a state of constant conflict, and which one of these two minds is winning dictates how we make our decisions. Now, what we don't really want to happen is for our primitive pal to win the day and to drag us into the nonsense zone here. But the struggle is real and the tug of war rolls on. And sadly, sometimes our primitive pal has his way. Like when my high mind says, hey Josh, you had a big lunch, perhaps don't eat that cupcake. But my primitive pal screams, quick Josh, eat that cupcake before some pesky kid steals it. <laughs> no comment. And on the struggle goes. Sometimes our higher mind wins the day, and sometimes our primitive pal does, and sometimes things land kind of in between. And we can liken this to a four-rung ladder. On the top rung, your higher mind is in control. Here you objectively and logically observe evidence and reach conclusions with emotional detachment to discover the truth, irrespective of what that truth may be. Now we can call this thinking like a scientist. On the second rung down, your higher mind is still in control, but your primitive mind is also playing a bit more of a role. We can think of this as, as thinking like a sports fan. You can know and respect the rules of the game, but you totally want your team to bring that trophy home. And so you're not impartial on this rung. And you may even be subject to the confirmation bias that our scientist friend at the top there would avoid. Now, on the third rung down, I think that's where the problems really start. Here, your primitive mind has a far greater say. And as somebody with a legal background, I can say with a degree of confidence that on this rung, you're thinking like a lawyer. You'll argue for your position no matter what, because you're not just motivated to be right, you are obligated. On this rung, you'll find people emphatically claiming that the earth is flat, or I don't know, that leaving the EU will magically deliver an extra £350 million <laughs> for the NHS a week. Now, on the final and fourth bottom rung, your primitive mind, he's taken over. He has stormed the capital and he is having an absolute riot. Now here you're thinking like a zealot. Your beliefs are your children and nobody can tell you that they are not perfect. You don't need to do any digging. You don't need to do any research to prove that you're right because you just know that you are. No amount of evidence to the contrary will convince you otherwise and any challenge is seen as a form of personal attack. And so by applying Urban's ladder to the world, you can start to look at divisive issues in terms of how people think rather than what they think. Whether the topic is climate crisis or it's a political one, if you look at the situation in terms of what rung a person is working on, then things start to make a little more sense. And so here I found an indication of what was going on in 2016 and perhaps since. You could say that there has been a steep rise in people operating on those bottom two rungs. And this leads me to question, what is it about our environment that's given rise to this form of low-rung thinking? I guess you could say that there has been a shift towards, I guess, tribalism, towards polarisation. And ultimately, low-rung thinkers, they need to have somebody, an enemy, essentially, 
who they can fight, a them to their us. Now, I heard suggest that when the wars of the 20th century came to an end, the big scary them of other countries was no longer a threat, and so we started to look elsewhere for a scrap. And I believe that's why the victors of the 2016 election in the US and EU referendum results. I believe that's why the dialogue centered around border control and why it was so effective, because they effectively othered immigrants. They provided an enemy, a threat to our way of life upon which our attention and our blame could be placed. Rather than objectively analysing policies in the context of social and economic trends, othering provides a double whammy. It shifts the focus from the real issues, which may fall at your feet, and those feet may be positioned in front of a dispatch box in the House of Commons, but, and here's the winner, it also rallies people to your cause, to your flag, or to your party. And hey presto, what you've whipped up is a polarising identity politics perfect storm where people feel driven to make a stand either in one camp or in the other, steadfast in their belief that people in the other camp are just wrong and they might even be bad people. And these echo chambers compound homogeneity, leading toward people becoming more extreme in their views. Internet connectivity has, I think, paved the way for polarisation to surge. The ease with which we can consume media, and as I said earlier, the effectiveness with which recommender algorithms serve up the content the dishes that we crave ensures that the table is laid for a frankly awful Christmas dinner, uh, a heated environment where I think it's fair to say that the stuffing balls start to look like cannonballs and those sprouts start to look a bit like musket balls. And so down that ladder we fall. All got a bit dark, didn't it? I don't see a dark dystopian future on the horizon. Far from it. Looking to the future, I see the utility, I see the vitality of our role as library knowledge and information professionals growing ever stronger. In an era marked by echo chambers, algorithms and information overload, we are still there. We are still there enduring as we have been since times immemorial, helping human beings to navigate the vast seas of data, information and knowledge. And we will continue to play a crucial role in ensuring that information is accessible, reliable and trustworthy. Because when we are at our best, we empower individuals from all walks of life to use the tools, develop the skills that are needed to critically evaluate and to navigate complexity, enabling them to separate fact from fiction and to make informed decisions. And what's more, by bringing those people together from those different walks of life in our spaces to discover new things and perhaps explore challenging issues, we create moments of connection and those moments of connection enable people to see things from another person's perspective, to see another person in front of them, to climb a rung higher on that ladder by accepting the possibility that another person's perspective or ideas might be valid. I think it's fair to say that our people will continue to need libraries ever more, our resources, our knowledge, but also our kindness and our compassion, the communities that we create, and our open doors. Because let's face it, we are living in times that are simultaneously amazing and amaze. In the week preceding this conference, I encountered 
news headlines that ought to seem stranger than fiction, but for some reason no longer did. So in the same week that it was announced that the globally renowned climate activist Greta Thunberg will take part in this year's Edinburgh Book Festival, firefighters fought to control a wildfire in the Highlands, which could be the largest recorded in the UK. Experts, including technology leaders and academics, warned us that artificial intelligence could lead to the extinction of humanity. And my personal favorite, an alleged former Russian spy whale was spotted <laughs> off Sweden's coast. <laughs> Colleagues have no doubt that the world will continue revolving and evolving at a startling pace. But for me and for countless other people across Scotland, our libraries will remain a steady, trustworthy and reassuring guiding hand on the choppy seas. In a world where the proliferation of information, misinformation and disinformation threaten to erode the very foundations of democracy, libraries stand as beacons of truth and reason. As open ecosystems, as hubs where relationships are formed, where collaborations are born and where the seeds of positive change can be sown. And so with hope and curiosity, we hoist our sail in the space between where truths prevail. We must continue to adapt, to innovate, to endure, to embrace emerging technologies, all while staying true to our core values, our core purpose and our core mission. We must remain vigilant, ensuring equitable access of information and resources for all members of society, particularly those from minoritised and marginalised backgrounds. We must also work to cultivate those partnerships, those collaborations with other institutions, organisations and stakeholders to amplify our impact and to address the complex challenges of our time. Now, that may sound like a profound ask. It may feel like a load that's too heavy to carry amidst tightening constraints. But as resources shrink, I think our resolve must grow ever stronger. We are now and always have been about more than buildings or repositories of books. We are the guardians of knowledge, the champions of discovery. And we are the facilitators of connection. Libraries empower individuals. They strengthen communities. They champion intellectual freedom and democracy. And so as we look to the future, I think we can be assured of the vital role that we will continue to play as we thrive as beacons of hope that light the way in the space between for discovery, exploration, and connection and so i just want to say thank you to each and every one of you sitting in the auditorium today because by my way of thinking there is no greater purer work in the world than to ensure equitable access to information knowledge and resources for people from all walks of life whoever they may be and i know that isn't always an easy road to walk on but please take solace knowing that you walk in the company of others who are likewise committed to that role. Thank you sincerely for all that you do. time for questions, so if anyone would like to ask Josh anything, now's the time. Amina? Josh, that was just simply spectacular. Thank you so much. And you weren't here yesterday, but this really um, chimes with a lot of what we heard yesterday as well about kindness and connection and libraries' role in that. 
And uh, when I was thinking about all of what I've heard over the past couple of days, I wonder, wh what do you feel about that um, diminished role of libraries as third space um, over time, <laughs> the financial constraints that have annihilated the opportunities you know, across the board, particularly in public libraries? And uh, does that sometimes feel, you know, in that reflection, um, to be purposeful? And one of my favourite writers, Alif Shafak, talks very much about what you're saying in her book, you know, How to Stay Sane in an Age of Division. And it, it seems to me that how to get people to go into camps, or from your description, the lower ladder thinking, is to not give them the chances to be together um, and to connect. I think, you know, I agree. I think over time we've seen um, a range of public spaces um, shrink in a way, be they public parks, be they our libraries, be they our community centres. Um, and that strikes me as one of the first and most fundamental failures of the, the end of the 20th and start of the 21st century. And I do think it's interesting that at the same time as we've seen those public spaces um, sometimes disappear off the map, what we're actually seeing now are a range of commercial providers popping up and providing, for example, WeWork spaces. I think, you know, there's something that makes us uniquely human that is really all about looking across a table and seeing another human being and being in a space with people. That kind of concept of working alongside somebody else, even if you're not working with them. If there's one thing that really separates us in, in my mind from um, the animal kingdom. It's relationships, you know, it's connection, it's community, it's really caring for one another. And I think that any environment that causes us to move further away from one another is inevitably going to provide those opportunities for the seeds of division to grow and separate people further. And as I sit here, I'm conscious that I don't have the answer but I think our profession holds the answer. I think that we are absolutely key. And I guess there is a recognition there that the advocacy that SILIP and SILIPS and other IFLA member organisations do around the world to champion uh, the virtues and values of what we are all about, that work is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm.